final talk of the day, which is from Lawrence uh, Voulis, and who will be talking about the distribution of lake sizes in Arctic deltas. Hey, uh, good morning. Thanks for introducing me, Professor Moriarty. Uh, so let me hide this thing. So uh, yeah, my name is Lawrence, and um, thanks for being here today. I'm going to speak about the distribution of lake, si lake sizes in Arctic deltas. So briefly, um, why we care about these lakes. Uh, well, Arctic deltas are uniquely characterized by abundant lakes, um, whereas temperate deltas are not. So this is the Colville River Delta here in Alaska. And uh, for reference, and this is the Wax Lake Delta, which is in the Gulf Coast, um, sorry, the Gulf of Mexico. So you can see all these lakes that uh, you don't see on other deltas. Um, and little attention has been d paid to what the distribution of lake sizes, so like the distribution of lake areas is, and what processes might generate the underlying dis that observed uh, distribution. And in general, that's important if you have like um, lake size parameterized, especially as a nonlinear function in a, in a land surface model for like energy budget or methane budget. And also rapid warming of the Arctic is leading to changes, um, but it's not exactly clear what those changes are, the magnitude of the changes or the time scale of the changes. So the two questions that we're gonna be asking today and addressing are the lake, what, what is the lake size distribution um, and are lake distribution characteristics related to climate or hydrogeomorphology? And these are the couple of the, del of the deltas that we study. So the seven deltas that we study are, are pictured here, ringing the Arctic Circle, and we go from the Mackenzie, going in this little circle, all the way down to the NSA. So the data set that we use to analyze the deltas is called the Global Surface Water Data Set, and it's Landsat derived, so it's 30 meter spatial resolution, and it's monthly composited water masks. So you composite several Landsat masks to generate a monthly image, so a July image for a given year. Um, and this is an example of the, of the water masks here uh, over the Kalima Delta, and white shows water and gray shows land. Now, if we went to another year, Landsat 7 striping and cloud cover make it so there's a lot of no data, and extracting accurate uh, lake or water body areas is really difficult to do when you have all this no data. To extract the water bodies, I'm gonna hop over to the schematic, which we'll be revisiting. We identify the connected components of water pixels shown here in blue uh, and ignore the land, basically. And we do this for the summer because you wanna minimize the amount of, of flooding that's on the landscape because we care, we care about lakes and not about all the ephemeral inundation uh, from snow melt. So we go back to the Kalima and we have extracted these. We've overlain the water bodies that we've identified in pink, okay? Uh, and we look at the uh, histogram of water body areas. And uh, in the literature, people since a lot over the 20th century have hypothesized, well, okay, lakes have a power law distribution. They might have a lake log normal distribution. That might be because you have an inundated landscape. Uh, and the water body area is not power law and it's not log normal. So uh, that kind of begs the question, what is the water body area PDF? And one thing that's going on though is that when we look at the water bodies from this water mask, it includes both wetlands, so areas that are simply wet ephemerally because it's kind of wet that year, or, and rather, perennially inundated lakes. And these lakes are generally thermocarst lakes, that's what we're interested in. And the question is, how do you separate the two in your analysis? So the GSW data set that I mentioned, it's actually a temporal stack. So it, it's from 1999 to 2018, it generates these monthly masks and we're gonna, utilize that information to separate the two classes. So imagine we had a given year and then we come back to the schematic, right? We could extract our water body as these six pixels and we observe it again next year and there is, now this is land and maybe that's because uh, the shoreline moved a little bit or you, you know, uh, it could be a little dry that year and we go to year three and now all of a sudden there's a no data pixel for whatever reason uh, from the observation and we go to year four. And we uh, might have a little uncertainty in how we call the water body, but let, let's just say um, we want to know how often water was present at every point in the landscape. So we take the vertical average here through time. We define the pixel 
water occurrence, okay? And the pixel water occurrence is the fraction of years that a pixel was classified as water. Um, yeah. So for this point, you'd have 75% water occurrence. Everywhere else is 100% water occurrence. You discard the no data, so it's like you didn't have an observation that year. And here you have 0% water occurrence. Then we go to a year that has really good data quality, like uh, the one I showed you earlier for the, for the Kalima, and you outline your water bodies. You then impose that water body mask on the occurrence, the pixel water occurrence, and we compute the mean of the pixels, and we call that the water body occurrence. So this water body that we identified in, say, 2016, has a water body occurrence of 96% in this case. Then you simply take a threshold, and you say, and we say if, it's a, if the water body occurrence is above theta, it's a lake. If it's below theta, it's a wetland. And in the analysis, I'm going to present, uh, in the results, I'm going to present, we use a theta of 0.85. So if a water body has an occurrence of 85%, it's a lake, and that allows for some, uh, uh, some ephemerality on the edges. Uh, and if it's below, it's a wetland. And we do sensitivity analysis, and our results are all robust uh, for a range of thetas, at least from 80 to 90%. Okay, so come back to the Kalima, and we have this occurrence map that we... Uh, uh, generated. And here are some examples of lakes versus wetlands. And blue here is water, or 100% occurrence, and brown is 0% occurrence, so it's land. And we come back to the histogram earlier, and we can decompose the histogram into, size frac uh, into fractions of lakes versus fractions of wetlands uh, as a function of area. And we see that, obviously, these two have different fractions, so smaller, smaller water bodies are mostly wetlands. And the thing is, if we want to study the size distribution, we need to go directly to the, to the PDFs, right? And the PDF is the probability density function. So we want what's the probability density function of lakes. So each of these curves has normalized uh, area under the curve one. And I'm going to focus on the lakes today. And I'll simply tell you that the wetlands have a very different size distribution. So coming, we're going to move that plot over to the left now. And we look at the PDF and we say, well, that's an interesting looking PDF. And we look at the exceedance probability and we say, what if it's a log normal distribution and we fit it and it's fit and it's significant at the 90% level. There's a truncation parameter here because we don't look at uh, water bodies less than six pixels because we don't trust their area. Uh, and we've managed to fit a log normal distribution on the Kalima. If we go back to all seven deltas, and I'm not going to show the fitted distributions here because it would look terrible, and we look at all seven curves here, all seven PDFs and all seven exceedance probabilities, all seven deltas have log normal distributions of lake areas. So once we control for ephemeral water bodies, we are able to, uh, we are able to detect a log normal distribution of lake areas on Arctic deltas. Furthermore, I've colored these according to delta latitude at the apex of the delta. If we look at these seven deltas, we could qualitatively observe that the, as you get further north, it seems that the distribution is shifted further to the right. If we pull up the mean lake area and plot it versus latitude, we observe a weakly significant trend in mean lake area. So the mean area trends with latitude is 10 to some small coefficient. And that means as you go over about 5 degrees latitude, lake area incre increases by about 30%. Um, and this, again, is a weakly significant relationship. So this, uh, we're not 100% sure why. We have some hypotheses that the further north you are, uh, the longer lakes are able to be sustained on the landscape, and there's greater ice content. And this is something we're investigating further. So why the log, and I'm gonna step back now and say why the log normal distribution and why does every, uh, all the deltas that we analyzed have a log normal distribution um, in the Arctic? Well, generally, uh, thermocarst lakes grow via thermal abrasion of lake shorelines. So if we assume that the, that the growth of these lakes is proportional to the volume or heat content of the lakes, it's inverse, inversely proportional to the lateral surface area, we can show uh, and I have the equations hidden, uh, that the area at a given uh, at time plus one is equal to a growth rate times the area at time t. Now, 
Uh, T is a random variable because we don't know the growth rate and it fluctuates from year to year. Um, and given a certain hydroclimatologic state, some fluctuations in uh, temperature, precipitation, soil properties, et cetera, um, will uh, be random, right? So if you integrate this to a long time T, this is a known proportionality model and it leads you to a log normal distribution. And that's why we observe the log normal distribution. And this was originally proposed by uh, Viktorov uh, for an English version of the paper, it's in 2015. So in summary, uh, we present this water body classification technique to distinguish perennial lakes from ephemeral wetlands uh, using the global surface water time stack. Uh, lake areas in Arctic deltas are log normally distributed and it's explained by this proportional growth model of thermal crust lake expansion. And lastly, there's evidence for increasing lake size with delta latitude, which we think is related to lakes being uh, able to stay in the landscape longer uh, and there being greater ice content uh, the further north that you get. So thank you uh, for your time and my email is below if you have any questions and I'll take any questions now. And I see there's the chat is blowing up. Um, yes, we have a talk from Shelby who says, or a question from Shelby who says, great talk. That's interesting that you noted a subtle increase in lake area with delta latitude. I'm interested if you noticed or explored geophysical properties of the delta in relation to lake area, i.e. delta shape, size, number of active river channels. Uh, no, we've only so far investigated the lake size distribution on the deltas and we'll be following up on that, but Anastasia Polurias at um, Los Alamos has done quite a bit of work and she had a paper in JGR this year exploring that. You can take a look at her paper.